Okay, now we have this nice theory about general intelligence, um, but we can't do practical things with it. We need to approximate that. And that's a very difficult um, problem. And there are various ways you could sort of try to do that. And um, I've developed with my group various approximations, and two of them are in a stage where we can really run the systems and play around with them. Um, two others are approximations, so they're now computable, yeah? but still way beyond you know current computers and probably for long future computers. Yeah? You could try to um, do that heuristically or um, principled. And I think one important um, aspect or way to proceed is that um, you built in a lot of standard algorithms, especially for the, I call it, interface parts of intelligence. So, for instance, it would be ridiculous to take a video camera of high resolution and directly feed it into any raw approximation of IXE. What you would do is you take the most modern computer vision algorithms and pre-process this very big data stream into something which is more reasonable. Same with um, sound. Yeah? And with the actions, it's a little bit simpler, so we don't have this rich, uh, or we are probably or robots too, yeah, and, and most agents here yeah, don't have such a rich output stream, they have a rich input stream, but not such a rich output stream. But you could imagine an agent which not only has eyes, but has a display, you know, <laughs> then he has a rich output stream. So, and then you take um, the um, um, computer vision, as a pre-processing, current computer vision algorithms as a pre-processing and then feed it into, into IXE. And there are many other useful modules. I mean, take even some standard statistics of regression or modern machine learning algorithms for simple, simple quotation marks, IID data. Yeah? And you use all these um, modules which have been well designed and optimized and run fast yeah, as components, pre-processing and post-processing in the universal AI framework and you leave the universal AI for the core reasoning part. And in this way um, I hope you can get ultimately a computationally efficient system. So um, there are of course alternative approaches to AGI and the most prominent one is well we have one example of an intelligent system, and that's the human. Yeah, so why not reverse engineer a human? And um, many inventions, you know, look at nature and then copy nature. Right? There are a few exceptions, like the wheel, yeah? um, and sort of X is more wheel than artificial legs. But the neurobiological approach um, is uh, a sound approach too. What I think is missing yeah, is a couple of, and probably a couple of more, I call it conservation principles. Yeah? So think about a physical system and try to come up with equations which describe them and then you simulate them and you will see it will not help, will not work. It will either explode or die out. And after a while you come up with the right equations and Newton's equations, well they were great. Yeah? But if the systems get more complicated, it gets very, very complicated. Yeah? So um, what then physicists have found out is, well we have something which is energy conservation. Yeah? And it's very, very crucial that the theory conserves energy. Well, we now have design principles yeah, to design theories which automatically conserve energy, right? You, you design them and they have energy conservation and then momentum conservation and all these kinds of things. So, um, so now you take this theory and take a naive approximation on a PC, discretize everything. Either the system will explode or will doubt it will not work. So you try more and harder, and at some point you realize, oh, my approximation violates energy conservation. So what you have to do is, you have to develop an approximation which conserves energy, and then you're fine off. And if you don't have this insight, oh, there is something which I have to really absolutely conserve, you will always fail. And I have the feeling the same is true when you try to reverse engineer the human brain, or maybe artificially create one based not on the universal AI approach, some other more heuristic or more practical or more in human inspired approaches. Yeah, that all this is fine. Neural nets are great. Yeah, but some things need to be conserved. Yeah, I mean the spiking 
density for instance. You, it can easily die out or explode. You need this to have conserved. And I'm pretty sure there are a handful or maybe 20 or hopefully not more than 100 of very important aspects, quantities or whatever you want to call them, which need to be absolutely conserved or to a high degree and you need to know that and you need to design it in this way. Otherwise, for some reason, it will just not work. And in physics, we know we have energy conservation, we have momentum conservation, angular momentum conservation, and and in in, in particle physics, we have a new other quantum numbers. You know, I mean, if they are not conserved, you know, everything would collapse. You know, all the particles will not be stable. Yeah, and this needs to be understood and known and built in. And for these neurobiological approaches, I think this is important to learn about these principles and then build them in. Um, in order to spur um, interest and awareness of the close relationship between data compression and learning and intelligence, um, I put out a prize. Um, it's, it's still running. Um, it's an ongoing contest. And what we did is we took um, a reasonable fraction of human knowledge and the original idea was to take one gigabyte of, say, Wikipedia, which corresponds to the um, symbolic knowledge of an adult human brain, not the visual knowledge. Yeah, um, you know, you know, maybe that is grossly off, but you know, that is some people believe that it's reasonable, and it doesn't really matter too much for the contest. Yeah, and for practical reasons, we didn't take a gigabyte, but only hundred megabyte. And if you are able to compress this hundred megabyte better then the best current compressor, by a certain percentage, you get this percentage of the price. So very similar to um, this mouse price, and where you also get a percentage of the price for prolonging the life of the mouse. And on the website it's explained, you know, why um, better and better compression corresponds to better and better understanding and better and better um, prediction. So, okay, so why is compression related um, to prediction and which is an important part of intelligence? Yeah? So, it's, um, it's all about induction. So, induction infers models from data and Occam's Railsa tells us to use simple models. Okay? And the simpler the model, the more likely is it that this model is correct or useful or whatever. Yeah? Um, and in this sense, compression gives you, so if you compress data, yeah, it gives you better models of the data. So what is a compressed form of your data? If you create a self-extracting archive and run it, it reproduces your data. So a self-extracting archive is a model of your data. Actually, it's a perfect model, right? Yeah? And the nice thing is, if you do it properly, it reproduces your data, but then it continues to produce more data, fictitious data. And this fictitious data you can use for prediction. And it turns out, and you can prove that rigorously, that the better your compressor is, the better these predictions will be. So one exciting approach to AGI would be to combine both approaches. Yeah? So you have the principled IXI approach and because it's based on a fundamental optimization principle, it cannot or it's much less likely that it will sort of die out in this sense or explode, right? Yeah? Um, on the other hand, it's not computable and it's very abstract. And then you have the neurobiological approaches and you all these models modules which you have understood yeah, if you combine both. Yeah. So maybe IC can inspire some conservation quantities and principles and put that to the neurobiological approach. And then maybe together it works.